Dankeschön. Also, herzlich willkommen. Ist Mundart okay? Ist Deutsch okay? Ich sehe es Englisch. Ich kann es Englisch. Ja. Ich kann es Englisch. Wir können es Englisch. Wir können es Englisch. Englisch ist gut? Ja. Okay. Everybody, alle verstehen Englisch? Okay. <lacht> It's not perfect if I do it in English and then like five people are like, I don't speak English. So. Yes, so uh, you notice something different for today, which is the colorful logo. Hello. Uh, let's get started. We have 45 minutes. I have the timer here, so to speed through this, I won't read all of that, but that's the general outline. Um, and uh, as you can see, where's my other thingy? Yeah, the demo will be ready soonish. Wait, there we go. All right, um, so about me, uh, I organize stuff. Uh, I do Rustfest. I also have a Rustfest t-shirt here, so for those of you who will be seeing me tomorrow in this. Um, Ernst Eisprung is a very alternative festival uh, thank you. <laughs> some of you already know it. It's it's very great. I had uh, some good jokes written on it. Also, if you are into making T-shirts, um, maybe aufklären statt aufregen, or the other way around, aufklären statt aufregen. Yeah, uplift or upset. It's not perfectly translated, but yeah. All right. Tonight, well, tonight, yes. Uh, basic computer networks. Woo! Common assumptions. TCP and TLS, so this will be the refresher part. Uh, if I'm too fast, just scream, yell, throw yourself on the floor. Um, then also, encryption is not that hard, to be honest. Um, I switched my whole demo last night from um, from the old Actis to the new one, from OpenSSL to Rustles, and now it uh, supports TLS 1.3. Woo! Okay, also we will learn what the actor model is, which is probably what most people who were at university don't know anything about. And also RPC is remote procedure call, which is basically what you do when you type in something in your browser. Goes to another system, asks the system to do something and returns with the result. Alright, multiprocessing. First of all, why? Uh, we could just have faster hardware, but that doesn't scale infinitely, and it's expensive as well. Plus, cooling is a problem. So we're now at the physical limit of uh, how to heat up stuff and still cool it. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, the CPU frequency kind of maxes out around 5 gigahertz, which is after the 5 gigahertz brand, you just burn your CPU. So instead of burning CPUs, we just do more of them. And now every smartphone has at least four strong CPUs inside. And yeah. So, and also for organization, it's way better. You can do remote work, which also means you can move the work somewhere closer to your customer or users. And while moving stuff around, we also can plan ahead for redundancy if some power plant fails or, I don't know, uh, a country loses internet connection, which also happens from time to time. Okay, how do we do that? So the first approach was multi-socket. We just had one motherboard with two CPUs in it. Then we had SMP, which meant simultaneous multiprocessing. <coughs> so inside one socket, multiple cores. So we have now two, four cores on one board. Inside each core, we have eight cores each. And then we have hyperthreading, or however AMD calls it, um, which basically doubles or almost doubles the, the CPUs inside one socket. And we gain additional speed up until we hit Spectre, Meltdown, and the other fun stuff where it's just like, nah, 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 shut it down again. So, yeah, my last employer uh, lost 70% of the CPU power over the last year because 
yeah, first spectrum mitigation and then hyperthreading was broken, so they had to turn it off, which also cost 50%. And then, yeah. It was a very expensive machine, now it's a very expensive machine. <laughs> Alright. What if we can't fit all the CPUs inside one box? Right? Well, uh, turns out the, these ideas already had happened. Uh, SOCs, for instance, are a network of their own. They communicate inside them with network protocols. USB, for instance, is a network protocol that's used inside and outside of boards. Um, then there are uh, modern ARM chips which have different instruction sets on different cores which are in, on the same silicon, which is very interesting to me. And then you have message passing between the cores and callbacks between the cores, so your software has to be able to tell the difference between the cores. Very interesting stuff. Uh, little foreshadowing, the, the next TOC OS will support that, which is great. Um, uh, then our other uh, PCI, Ethernet, Wi-Fi. So, um, for uh, calculation-driven, computer-driven things, usually have pools, threads, OpenCL. For graphics cards, we have CUDA and, and whatnot. And over networks, well, we just have our stuff that we built. And that's what we're going to do, right? We are going to hmm? Hmm. something's fun funky. We're going to distribute that over many systems, and now let's look at this graph. So I made this graph in order to show you different things, and then I realized that when I do this, you will still see the original graph. So bear with me. Okay, point to point. It's the easiest of all. It's just like one. Thing. Bus is when all these are physically connected, and it's just like when you enter a signal here, floats everywhere. Then we have other topologies like star. Let's imagine this is our star in the middle, and we cut off these here, and we cut off that part over here. Then we have a star centralized. Then we have trees. We have a tree. So this is not a tree because it loops back. That right, tree is just going away. Um, then we have rings. It's imagine just this part up here. It's a ring. And then we have the whole thing. It's a mesh network. So very brief. We're running a little bit out of time here. <laughs> okay. But how can we deal with that? So first of all, we are here. We're programming this part. Right. We want to have data from one process to the next process. These are separated by different machines. So all the lower layers are very generic. Okay. So what are we going to do? Okay, for the first thing, cables, we usually don't do cables anymore, which is layer one. Data link layer is very common. It's Ethernet, free is IPv6 as we learned today. Uh, TCP IP is the combination of them, but TCP is its own layer for, or UDP or SPCP or whatever. Session layer, it's not 100% clear what session layer is in the OSI model, but uh, nowadays I would use this as encryption, keeping stable. And then presentation layer would be something like okay, um, we have internal keep alive stuff, we have maybe routing. In, inside our application, and then on top of that, we have our user commands, which is usually event driven by a uh, user doing something or not doing something. So, by sending data around, the system has to package it over and over again, transmit it over some physical medium or many, and then re reverse the process. And if we have routers, then we do this process up and down only to a certain degree. Right? We go through many switches, we go up to this layer, we go to routers, it's the next one, we go to firewall, it's up here. And in the end, between boxes, it's always the lowest level, layer. Lever, blah, blah. All right, so here are the assumptions. 
Um, of course this is reversed, because why? It's easy. Okay, layer 1, error correction is very important here. We have physical problems, like noise, defective cables, echoes and whatnot. And then we, we make groups, and the more groups we stack, the, the further away we can go. So you will later see the IP addresses I give you, they're also layered in, in different dimensions. Um, then we can partition the network, we can segment, uh, make, sorry, we can make a segment for private stuff, we can make a segment for lights, for the cameras, but not. Um, on layer 5, uh, where I said before it's a little bit political nowadays, uh, I think untrusted transport is, is a very good topic for, for that layer. So it, it does encryption, it transits over distrusted networks, and on layer 6 we can have multiplexing, so we can reuse connections from one application to another. So if we have uh, an application that does many things, the demo application you will see later will also do many things at the same time, but it will reuse one single connection. And uh, on top of that we can do what we want. We can play or... So, we are already here. Example project. This is the moment where like... <sighs> okay. So, if you want to play, Go to these URLs, hopefully. We'll see if that's already compiled. It is, it's running. So. <laughs> and. This one has a self signed certificate. Have you a Avaki now? Avaki? Avaki. 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 Warning, security Arch. Yeah. Uh, so the security warning is self-signed certificate, just accept it. Uh, it's a 4K RSA key and the uh, com common name should be distsys.estada.ch. And the last one is only link local IPv6, so I don't know if that works. I tried to access the service from the a free internet before, but that didn't work. Uh, so you have probably have to be inside the, the Wi-Fi. In WLAN. Okay, but that's Swiss 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 or clip tiles. So, ah, brilliant. Okay. So, I made this one. You have, maybe you have to scroll up here. And then you click on it, and then you should see uh, pictures. pictures down here and then you can click on other people's images and see them in between. I think there are questions. I'm, I'm very yes. disappointed it's not like Rust compiled to JavaScript, it's just JavaScript. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well I tried to do it with Elm, to be honest. <laughs> but, uh, you know, time is finite. <laughs> um, but for the demo I used uh, a very Elmish approach. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 
We'll talk more about the architecture later. All right. <coughs> what are the goals? So, there are three goals in mind with this project. First, share your images and uh, then keep control. And also make it very easy to set up. Like, uh, all I have to do to set this up is provide the program with two key files and then start it. Everything else is packaged and, and comes along. So, and of course, we, we do it properly. So, user stories is first of all open browser, browse galleries, which, yeah, we have seen some before. <coughs> the other thing is share images. Click the share button, that works too. Oh, and since you are already interested on, on this topic, if you scroll down, you can see all the messages your client sends and receives in this gray box. This box is very helpful. Uh, because uh, asynchronous is hard. All right. So how can we split this up? So we have three roles. We have clients. We have the central hub, and we have the storage pods. Um, there are other architectures that work like that. Uh, Blender, for instance, uses the same model for its distribution. It's there. It's called client master slave. Client master slave where all the storage ports are connected to the hub. The, the hub decides what to do and routes the, the traffic and the clients always talk to the, to the hub. Yeah. This enables us the following, uh, which is always true, it's always non-blocking. And that's very cool. Because then we can add more and more clients and as long as the people don't click too fast, we don't need that much infrastructure. And by the blinking of, of this laptop, I can tell that lots of people are accessing this machine right now. But the, the fan doesn't turn on, so it's not that bad. Um, one big thing for me was I wanted to have the hub very strongly encrypted. And as I said before, uh, TLS 1.3 is around for uh, nine-ish months now. So uh, there is an implementation in Rust, inside Rustles. Rustles has um, its own set of problems, one of them being it can't read big keys, which is not documented. Whee! Thank you, Rustles. <laughs> uh, hmm? 4K is the limit. If any key is bigger than 4K, it will fail with weird errors. That's enough for this. Yeah, but when you, uh, for some reason, have an 8K key laying around and don't know that, then your application breaks and you're like, why? I mean, isn't, mm -hmm. just a random question, doesn't Telas support, like, non-RSA stuff? Like, EC, whatever? Yeah. It does, <laughs> but then you would have to uh, generate. Yes, I, I think if you enter into like 4K is not enough directly, then you first need to switch to the elliptic yeah. curves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's not really a bug, that's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but sometimes old implementations are able to handle bigger RSA keys mm -hmm. but don't know anything about elliptic yeah, yeah. curves. So, yeah. Um, cool. There is also another uh, project to implement the storage side in uh, pure Rust, so it doesn't run in the browser. But that project uh, halted a little bit. So how can we do that? We have lots of communication around everything. Everything is async, everything is very strange. So let's do it with Rust, because with Rust we can also add a field in one point and be sure to add it everywhere else. Because the first time I tried something like this, I did it in JavaScript and all the hell, like, undefined is not there. So, the fuck? Okay. PDF is messing around. So, let's go through the files. Um, Carcotunnel. You notice this is version 0 0.2 already, so. Um, it's also using the latest edition, 2018, so we have all the new fancy features. And uh, I don't know if that's valid code, but um, yeah, I, I had to fit it on the slide. So all the code that's weirdly formatted, that's the reason. 16 to 9 is not great for displaying lots of code. Uh, we're using the latest 
Actics 0.8, which is based on SCD futures. If you're into Rust already, they're switching the backend, which means that uh, Actics 0.8 should theoretically support async already. Yes. And uh, 1.0 was released, I think, last week. It's, it's not on Crates.io yet. It's not Actics oh, Web. Actics Web. Actics Web. Yeah. yeah. Okay, everything's fine. Yeah, Actix Web is 1.0, yeah. 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 They, they already patched uh, something. Important for Actix users is you have to know about futures. Uh, f features, thank you. Uh, features have to be enabled. So all the crypto stuff has to be explicitly enabled for everything. Um, the other... Hmm? That's pretty cool. Yeah, and you can uh, switch uh, the implementations but the code is not abstract over the implementation. So if you use Rust TLS, then it uses, uses Rust tools underneath. If you use SSL feature flag, it uses OpenSSL. And if you use native TLS, it uses native TLS. Um, full disclaimer, native TLS was removed for 1.0 because they wanted to get it out faster. Uh, all right, Chrono is also very nice because uh, the server is able to tell when last modified happened, so that's what you see in the blue box for every gallery. Um, everything else, if you're new to Rust, quick question, who is new to Rust? Pretty, Pretty new, okay, so Cargo is the package uh, manager. We know that, we know that. Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, so I think it's our first package Zeta manager is which can specify features, which is really quite cool. Yeah. Uh, Serve is serialization and deserialization, and we enable it here for the time extension. Chrono is an extension to SCD time. Very cool because uh, then we can just tell the client, hey, this is an ESO string of a certain format that will include everything, including time zone. And what else? Oh, yeah, nflogger, very handy. It logs over environment variables. So. Cool. Let's look at the layout. Uh, the Linux users know tree probably. Uh, the cargo log file is uh, fixing the dependency. So if you clone this project and uh, life goes on, there's a very high chance that thanks to this log file, when you compile it, you will get this, uh, a working binary. Maybe not the same binary because the compiler has changed, or you're on a different platform, but you get a working binary. Identity files and uh, certificate files, make files. I know make files are, well, but they're very handy for scripting OpenSSL. So the keys I generate are uh, scripted with uh, this make file. Read me for short explanation. I split up the Rust code in, in three, the actors, the main, the protocols. When I did the upgrade, from uh, 0 0.7 to 1.0, I only had to touch the main file, which is great. So, hooray. And static, yeah, somebody play, uh, was like, well, it's not WebAssembly. Yes, it is not. That's why it works. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, from this point on, we would not be able to tell if it's WebAssembly because, I mean, it still would end up in GS, right? Uh, <laughs> Mm. I actually did a production project in WebAssembly recently and it's really nice by now. Mm -hmm. A lot of things changed in the last year. So with Rust and WebAssembly? Yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, I wanted to do it with Elm. It will operate generally. Yes. Thank you. Um, um, yeah. Oh, if you have a look at the code, this debug all is very handy because it catches all and every panics, uh, sorry, exceptions that occur inside the browser and give you at least an alert if you can't submit it anywhere else, which is very handy on, on a mobile phone when you get weird errors. Okay. Oh, and another thing, in, inside the CSS you can now use a thing called dash dash var, which is super great. So you don't have to use SCSS anymore. Anyhow, um, how do we start things? Uh, create an object, uh, active system. Why do we do that explicitly? Well, um, it makes it very easy to add a web server and a TCP server. So we can have 
different applications running at the same time. Then we need a centralized ID giver, which can be done with an arc mutex. And then we need a hub, and we just say, okay, we want to have one hub, one and only hub, have that synchronized and run that. So this sync arbiter is, is already, it's an actor that's living inside the system. Okay, how get uh, the keys? Yeah, again, doesn't fit quite well, but basically it's like this. We make a config, we read certificate, um, the key file, then we build the keychain, then we extract the keys, um, then we uh, insert them into our server config. This is the moment where the weird errors happen if you have a too big um, key file. And then we return. Hooray! For those of you who are new, uh, result is the answer to exceptions. We don't have exceptions in Rust and we are very happy. Okay, let's start the next big actor, the web server. Um, web server is a class of Arctic, and inside that we create an application. The, it used to be called with state, now it's called data. With data we create a couple, where we just insert, incrementer and the hub. And then, at that point, uh, everybody is familiar with the, the builder pattern. Perfect. Okay, with the builder pattern, we stack first service, and we say this service is a resource with its path, route that to, and then everything here is to, <coughs> and here we could add the next service. And we can add more and more of them. Uh, we, do, we don't, and in the end we say, okay, we bind, and this is one of the points where if you have encryption, then you have to decide which encryption, and then this call is different. Uh, some of them require a config, some call, uh, call it acceptor, some call it factory, uh, just give it the key material somehow, or don't at all. Alright, um, and what we do here already, is we already handle incoming connections. So with the WebSocket library, we can say, okay, we start a WebSocket actor. So every connection we have spawns a new actor in the system. And this actor, you can imagine as a representative of your connection. So when your browser is connected to the server, inside the server, the actor is representing you. You can't hack it, ideally, but uh, it acts on your behalf. Uh, yeah. And here you see why I have an incrementer. We have this ID, which is uh, globally unique. It's very handy to have something like that. And then we have the address of the hub. And by, by default, every connection is just viewing. So if we want to share something, the port functionality, we have to enable it with a special call. And then we're done. The second service we do here um, is to serve the static files. We have an index file, everything, show files, everything, and blah, blah, blah. Yes? What's the hub and what's the pod? Okay, a pod, in, in the concept, in general concept, the pod is the, the slave program that serves images on, on the request. It's an execution unit or something? <coughs> uh, that's more or less the idea. And then in, in the Rust code, a pod is, is a, it's a, it's a WebSocket client that serves images, that has a, a file listing ready on the hub. It's a participant in the network, basically? Yes. Okay. Yes. And um, why I call it a, a complete distributed system is because your browser runs these two functions, these two actors, at the same time. So one actor is, is the gallery actor, which views the stuff, and the other one is the the pod actor which shares stuff. Um, and the hub does, does dispatching? More or less, yes. Yeah. It also aggregates over time. So, um, when we have the, the WebSocket and we connect, this actor gets started. And in the start uh, command, we go to the hub and say, hey, I'm a new client, I want to subscribe to changes. 
So we sus subscribe to um, all new galleries that emerge or disappear. Every time the set of galleries changes, we get an update. Consequently, when the uh, connection breaks away, the actor notices, oh, my connection is gone, I have to self-destruct or stop myself, and then we unsubscribe with our ID and tell the central hub, we're gone. Huh? This enables also all sorts of cleanups because um, connection can die, but we can still gracefully react to this fact. All right. So when uh, we have RPC style requests, but stuff that would normally go to a REST API, we can handle it like this. We can say, okay, um, we have a client request. This is a certain message. We send it to the hub. Turn this message into an actor and give it a reference to ourselves so it knows how to uh, talk back to us. And when that's done, we say, okay, uh, we answer to the client and uh, we're done. Future, okay, empty type. For those of you who are new, um, empty type is just open close bracket. It happens all the time. Yes. And here you also see the, the big pros of having one big protocol. We'll, we'll talk about that later. But we can just say, certainly try to deserialize that. And uh, I made a names-based protocol. So um, we don't have to worry. Oops. My mouse. We don't have to worry about who oh, is the client allowed to send this or that because uh, at the border we can deserialize into pro uh, into our protocol if it's valid or not is decided on one line and then if the message that we received is valid we can then pattern match it because now we have Rust types so we only match the types that the user is allowed to so the user is not allowed to send us answer commands, right? Uh, for those of you who use Zulip, no, uh, not Zulip, Zoom, did you uh, get the message when they didn't check that? They would just process every message, so you could send a, a Zoom client a server command from any client and it would just like, oh yeah, the server asked me to do that, I will do that. And one of the things was uh, share, share screen and accept user input. So you could open uh, Windows R, type in commands, and press enter. Hooray! Was great. They fixed it. Okay. Um, yeah. Your question from before. What's the hub? It's a struct. It's a hash map with all the pod information, and it's a hash map with all the client information. And the pod info contains all the this stuff, like. Uh, What's the name of the gallery? What are the paths? Uh, when was it last updated? Uh, and this is a broadcast. It's basically a for loop which sends internal messages to all the actors that are connected. And the actors also have an inbox. And if the inbox receives a message, then it will get processed. So, quick recap on actors. What is an actor? An actor is a, is a normal struct that has an inbox inside the system and it lives inside the system. So if we have an address of an actor, we can send it messages, just like email. And the actor can react to these messages, accumulate state, like this one here, this is internal state, and react accordingly. Is that more or less clear? Only message passing. Okay, so how do we react to, to messages? We implement a handler for a certain type. It means the type system can tell us if we missed something. If we try to send a message to an actor that it can't handle, it will tell us we can't compile. Oh, yeah, this is how we subscribe. Just insert into the hash map with all the default information. So when a new connection comes in, the only thing we know about it is the name of the gallery empty path and modified now. Okay? And with that half that we broadcast that information to all the clients. So we receive a message from one port broadcasted to all the clients, not the ports. What happens if we have asynchronous style? If we don't have this nice RPC, okay that one requested something and we have to do that. 
then we have async and then we need to carry around the ID and that's why this, this ID is very handy if a client requests something and there are certain paths that it can't do, right? like this unreachable I can define at this say this must never happen must be handled by something else we'll rather terminate our server than let something uh, weird happen but for allowed commands like update title we can react and we can of course broadcast again broadcasting is, is probably the one function I use the most inside the hub functionality means that when you click on a gallery and the browser starts requesting the actual pixel data it will go to the hub and ask hey I want from the gallery number 42 I want to have the path slash whatever and then the, the hub will say okay this came from 23 so it will send to uh, the connection with ID 42 will send a message hey 13 requested that path from you and then it will wait and then the pod will answer us at some point hopefully with either a positive response which then contains the image data or a negative response not found and then we route that information back but because these are so independent we have to send the ID for the next one all the way throughout the system in and out all right This is the organization, use Savage uh, JSON. And why did I add danger zone here? Anybody have a clue? It's beautiful. Hmm? There's like perfect access. No, it's it's not not that. It's, it's another kind of danger zone. It's not that same what I did twice. Mm -hmm. Guarantee that you don't have any conditions? Yes, that's it. Every function that accepts pod ID will accept any U64. So um, if we want to make this safe, we should switch that to a new type, which is a struct, which is a full type, so you can't uh, misuse that. The pro for using pub type is uh, you don't have to write dot zero, but that's about it. So. If that project grew any bigger, I would switch that into a, a new type struct and then wrap it for good without having to think about it. Yes. But your idea would be that you cannot construct a pod ID unless you get it from an existing pod, right? Uh, yeah, well, and I have to be able to construct that at some point. Yes, but uh, you encapsulate that so that the rest of the code cannot access an invalid pod ID. That's the idea, right? No, um, the, the problem with, with pod ID is that you can uh, use all functions that accept uh, U64 yeah. even if they specify something else. So, um, in the beginning of the project I had client ID and pod ID. Right? And then at some point I had a function that would only accept client ID and by accident I filled in pod ID because they both boil down to U64. And then I realized that uh, it still worked and then realize I don't need client ID and then just drop that. But uh, if you have a bigger project, um, this is just an alias and it doesn't give you any type safety, so danger so. Oh yeah, Archer has a new uh, season running. <laughs> danger so. <laughs> okay, <coughs> back on topic. We only have five more minutes. Um, this is the super protocol I was talking about before. So, it looks very redundant, right, left and right, inside, outside, this is the syntax for a uh, new type if you're new to Rust. Just name, round brackets, one thing, and done. This is, this is that, we wrap everything, which means, in the end, uh, we jump around here, we get these scopes, right? This is the serial, uh, the serial format, the packed format 
of, of, the, of this protocol is always prefixed so that everything is scoped. It's very handy because we can match it everywhere. We have no conflict even if we have stuff that's named the same and has the same type argument. So, uh, super protocol. Very handy in the end, a bit ugly to code, but usually when we have some entry point where we match the super protocol and then dispatch the sub protocols to different actors or different modules or different functions. So it's not as bad as it sounds and it helps to pre-structure the code a bit. Okay, what can we do? Client requests, we can uh, from browser to master. We can also define with this enum, it has to return a certain type. Right? So client response, which is not on the slide, it has to be that as an answer. We can guarantee that on the type system level. Async stuff, as I said before, uh, it's, it's basically fire and forget or fi fire and pray. Also, side note, if you serialize stuff, you can also skip fields or skip fields in one way. Right? Serde allows you to say, okay, this field, um, it has to be there, it must not be there, or uh, if it's not there, have a default for that. We can also annotate these little functions. Very handy. What we need for, um, for Actix is that they implement message. But we can derive that. Derive is very good. Okay. How do we debug them? Because you have a hard time remembering all, all the time. Let's just write a print function. Oh, this is the new function, one of the new. We don't expose that function too far outside of our crate, but that's a very handy debug function where we simply create all variations that we want to use and then once we have the full list we can look at them right we can check them on the wire in the browser if we get weird stuff we can go uh, into this output and say hey um, did the server do it right yes or no usually with with, with red with rust the answer is usually yes the, the server is right and the client is wrong very usually. And sometimes we also have this, right? It's not the same type necessarily because yeah, it's optional. So proposed ID allows the client to propose an ID. The current implementation just says, I don't care, I don't trust you. You will always get a new ID from the server when you connect. But we could, in theory, reuse stuff like that. Responses? And questions? No? Well then, thank you for your attention. Happy Pride, and we can play more with the demo if you like. Oh, and also I have one plushie to give away. Because the next Rust Fest is uh, probably November 9th in Barcelona. And you should all come. Hmm? Hmm? Well, uh, one thing that yes. uh, it's not a question, a comment. Sure. He wants it, he wants it. I want it. I want it. But don't throw it because that doesn't happen. <laughs> so you include OpenCL in an actor model, but OpenCL doesn't even make sense in an actor model. No, actor model is like, not OpenCL is actor. mostly SMD, like it doesn't really work with mm -hmm. actors at all. That was in the beginning of how to utilize more uh, oh. compute power. Like CUDA is also not, yeah, exactly. uh, not really an actor, model. Really an actor model. I mean, you can run stuff independently on the graphics card and then have the graphics card talk back to you. Well, because yeah, I can talk to my actual GPU's devices and mm. have the idea, right? Yeah. So you can have a, a GPU and CPU mm. and a very different type of device and distribute your loads across all those. I'm pretty sure it can, but like if you start implementing the actor model on OpenCL, you're gonna have a bad time. Yeah. No, maybe, maybe if you abstract it away enough, you can use OpenCL for mm. actor model. I mean, you can also use FPGAs for actor model, so you can use uh, VHDL or any of the other languages. No, well, so VHDL kind of like if you use one of PGA, actor mm. model kind of makes sense because you can make different chips. Make it communicate yes. inside the core, 
is we're just not in open CL. Like open CL is really like like well, one one CPU which does a million threads, or like one instruction million threads or whatever. It it can do that, but I'm pretty sure you could make it handle interrupts and then it's independent ish. Oh, you can, and people use it for great things, but it's just mm. like really not what they're designed for. No, no, but <laughs> hey, <laughs> when have we ever used something for a design purpose, well, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I mean, that's, I mean, <laughs> that's actually why OpenCL is so big, is that not the OpenCL, yeah. but just the graphics card, and they mm. use OpenCL for graphics, and it's such a common cause, mm. that's why it really drives the cost down. Mm. It's not really like open CL CUDA does it's not what makes GPU cards cheap. What makes mm -hmm. GPU cards cheap is the actual intended purpose. <laughs> oh yeah, by the way, um, the whole example that you have been playing around with and um, hopefully worked, um, the message uh, queue size of each actor is ten. I have never changed that and I ran that in, in a very fast Wi-Fi in, in Budapest and 20 people started sharing pictures over it. So, um, actor model is really fast. And if you don't trust me, ask Ericsson. <laughs> they built their empire on actors. I know Erlang. Yeah, Erlang is cool. <laughs> yeah. It's not that fast. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. It's robust. It's very robust. Yeah, WhatsApp used to be built on it, or it still is, maybe. I don't know. Just use the library, whichever yeah. library, and then start working on it. Hmm. Yeah, I'm waiting for Matrix to be written in Erlang. Something. Something. All right, I think we should wrap up. I uh, don't have any more stuff to give away, and afterwards it's soon food. I hope so. Thank you again.